Autism Talk TV. I'm here with Jack Robeson, fellow Aspergian and son of the author of Look Me in the Eye. So, Jack, why don't you tell everyone about the uh, episode they're about to see? We interviewed Steve Silberman, who is a writer and contributing editor for Wired Magazine. And uh, we asked him about an article he wrote about 10 years ago called The Geek Syndrome, which is about autism in Silicon Valley. For those of you who haven't seen the article, it's a very popular article and is referenced a lot by people in both the, the geek world and, and also in the Asperger world, although I, I assume those two overlap. worlds over, yeah, exactly, <laughs> overlap. Name one famous Aspergian invention, Jack. BitTorrent. That's how I get all my movies. Yep. I know that. The ones that I've already bought. <laughs> yes, the ones that I've already purchased. I get a backup copy through BitTorrent. Next is about significant things that people with Asperger's have contributed to society throughout history. Excellent. I want to thank Steve for giving us the scoop on his next book. I think that's the first scoop that Autism Talk TV has sort of yeah. let out into the public uh, eye. Also, he got us lunch. Oh, yes. He bought us dinner, so, in fact. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> um, that was a delicious dinner at a very expensive type of restaurant. With a train going around. Uh, yeah, the there's a train the dri driving around uh, on the ceiling and stuff. Yeah. Um, very Aspergian, I would say. Exotic. Excellent. Well, let's go to the clip. Sometime in the year 2000, I was on a cruise ship with a bunch of programmers in Alaska. And one of the people on the boat was Larry Wall, the inventor of Perl, a very well-known open source programming language. And I was writing an article about that cruise. And I asked Larry if I could come to interview him after the cruise was over. And he said, yes. But I should tell you, we have a profoundly autistic daughter. And I didn't have any experience with people on the spectrum before. I didn't know exactly why he was preparing me for that, but I thought, okay. I went and interviewed Larry, and in fact, his daughter wasn't at home that day. A few months later, I was writing about someone else, another very gifted technology person in Silicon Valley. And I asked him if I could come over and interview him at his house, and he said, I should tell you that we have a very autistic daughter. And I thought, that's an odd thing to hear a couple of times in a couple of months. I wonder what this means. I was telling that story to a friend of mine sitting in a cafe in San Francisco. And the person at the next table said, oh my God, you don't know what's happening? And I said, what's happening? And she said, there's an epidemic of autism in Silicon Valley. And I said, really? And she said, yeah, nobody knows about it, but I'm a special ed teacher, and there, I'm seeing many more autistic kids in my classes than I used to. And I thought, well, that's odd. I'll check that out, because since I was a writer for Wired Magazine, anything that was happening in Silicon Valley was of interest. And it was particularly of interest to me that this funny coincidence had happened in, in the last couple of months. So I started a long research process to figure out if it was true that there was, quote unquote, an epidemic of autism in Silicon Valley. What's interesting is that 10 years later, I don't know if it's true even now. And in fact, I think we still don't know exactly why the rates of autism diagnoses are rising. But what I do know is that I wrote a story called The Geek Syndrome that was published in Wired. And I have never gotten so much response to an article that I got to that article. In fact, Every couple of weeks, I still get email about it, even though it was a, an article that came out almost 10 years ago in a magazine, which is nearly unheard of. Usually the human memory for magazine articles is about two weeks after an article comes out. But I have seen copies of that article that had been copied multiple times on Xerox machines. Many people had told me that they gave that article to their parents or to their kids to explain what life is like on the spectrum, because I don't only talk about autism in Silicon Valley, but I, I talk a lot about historical approaches to the spectrum and different ways that it's been viewed. And I uh, interviewed a bunch of families who had autistic kids and talked to a bunch of parents who self-diagnosed after their kids were diagnosed, etc. So I ended up writing another article on people on the spectrum a few years later, specifically about savant abilities. The main point is that that article never left my mind, and I thought that every paragraph in it wanted more information behind it. Like it was, it was like every paragraph in that article was was a potential door that I could use to 
examine history, examine the ways that people on the spectrum have been mistreated, misconceived all these years. Also looked at the ways that autism itself was a window into the larger question of neurodiversity. Every time I thought I should really write more about that or perhaps write a book about it, I ended up getting, my time ended up getting taken up by writing another article, you know, whenever, whatever the next subject was. But finally now, almost 10 years later, I have the time and the space in my life to go into all of the subjects that I brought up in that article much more deeply. And that's what brought me to Autreat, was that even though I had gotten to know autistic people over the years and had uh, spent time with the families that I wrote about, I had never been in a large group of autistic people. And I thought that even though, in a sense, I would be an outsider, that it would be really a privilege just to be here and not as any kind of authority on anything, more like a completely stupid idiot with open ears and, and uh, an open mind and just be around people on the spectrum enjoying each other's company. What I'm discovering is that many of the things that we take for granted in our technological world were really produced by people who were somewhere on the spectrum. Things like BitTorrent, things like Craigslist, things that really changed our world and made the world a lot better for everyone were, in a sense, gifts of people who are on the spectrum. And I suspect that that has always been true throughout human history, that people on the spectrum have been, in a sense, craftsmen and creating pieces of culture that then got passed down. Even if they didn't have kids, they ended up producing these artifacts or bodies of knowledge. Many of the discoveries in chemistry were made by people who were suspected to have been on the spectrum. I think that probably much of science has been conducted for hundreds of years by people on the spectrum. And that what we think of, what neurotypicals think of as human culture, that huge chunks of it are inherited from people who are on the spectrum. And so that's the kind of thing that I want to explore in my book.